Welcome to Forest Hills Church Online. My name is Pastor Andrew, and uh, we want you to know that we're a church who loves God with all of our heart. We seek to grow in our faith, and we hope to serve through the empowering of the Holy Spirit. So we are so glad that you are here. Welcome. Um, We are going to continue to comb through Paul's letter to the Colossians, and today we're talking about having a more mature palate, kind of setting aside our childish ways and growing, continuing to grow in maturity as we allow Christ to be our all in all. So Paul has a lot to say. We're going to tackle that um, this week. I also want you to know that we will be partaking of communion this week. So I'd like for you to be able to do that with us. If you want to just pause the video and go and gather some uh, bread and some juice or some elements that you can use to uh, take communion together with us, that would be excellent. And before we get started, I want to share with you our verse from Colossians 4.2, our verse for the week. Keep on praying and guard your prayers with thanksgiving. Colossians 4.2. Well, that'll set us up as we consider what Paul has for us in Colossians as we worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. All throughout my history your faithfulness is what beside me the winter storm made way for us free in every season everyone. This is the Grow Group ministry team here. Yes, it is already time to sign up for our spring grow groups. So let's take a look at what's going to be offered this time around. They walked with God, 40 Bible characters who inspire us. 
In a continuation of the Fall Grow Group, hosted by Steve Betker, we continue our in-depth look at the most influential people in the Bible. In this study by best-selling author Max Lucado, we'll walk alongside the men and women of the Bible and get to know ourselves better as we rediscover their stories as well. How Not to Read the Bible In this six-session study led by Anel Mix, we are guided by author Dan Kimball in a step-by-step -step process of how to make sense of, and putting into context, some of the Bible's most misunderstood, difficult, and crazy sounding parts of scripture through the use of stories, illustrations, and pop culture memes. Bible and Battlefield, Seven Lessons from the Civil War for Our Christian Faith Today. The Bible itself is filled with true stories about real people and their experiences. The same can be said about the Civil War. It was about real people, real experiences, and real issues. Join host and author Amanda Lucas as we seek to bring both history and the Bible together in a way that deepens faith and applies that history in a manner that today's society believes it often is not real and relevant. How to Pray a simple guide for normal people. Is prayer the most challenging part of your Christian faith? Join host Tracy Hansen for a journey through Pete Griggs' book on life-changing prayer. We'll explore how to start praying, how to keep things simple, how to ask God for things, and how to cope with unanswered prayers, and much more. How to Pray offers real-life methods to deploy in your prayer journey, as well as inspiring true stories to encourage and refresh your prayer life. The Gospel of John, Walking with Jesus. View Jesus through the lens of the Gospel of John this Lenten season. As we journey closer to Easter, follow Jesus as he enters ministry, his encounter with Nicodemus in John 3, the woman at the well in chapter 4, his many miracles, and the culmination in his arrest, trial, death, and resurrection. More information on each of these classes, as well as the sign-up sheets, are available in the lobby. Let's all commit to a closer walk with God this spring. Sign up for a girl group today. Paul's letter to the Christians in Philippi has much in common with his message to the Colossians. In this message, we see Paul encouraging his readers to stand strong in their faith. This fight begins with their thoughts. I'm reading from Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 9. Be glad in the Lord always. Again, I say be glad. Let your gentleness show in your treatment of all people. The Lord is near. Don't be anxious about anything, rather bring up all your requests to God in your prayers and petitions, along with giving thanks. Then the peace of God that exceeds all understanding will keep your hearts and minds safe in Christ. From now on, brothers and sisters, if anything is excellent and if anything is admirable, focus your thoughts on these things, all that is true, all that is holy, all that is just, all that is pure all that is lovely, all that is worthy of praise. Practice these things, whatever you learned, received, heard, or saw in us. The God of peace will be with you. Well, today we're diving into the third chapter of Paul's letter to the church in Colossae. And so far, he has expounded much on the supremacy of Christ. In fact, not much else that Paul says makes any sense without keeping in mind his thoughts about Jesus. And we've called this series Portions, because when it comes to uh, our own cultural landscape, the variety and accessibility of different worldviews and religions and opinions and perspectives is much the same. It's much like a buffet where we're encouraged to pick and choose and to mix and match and come up with our own flavor of divinity. And so Paul's message to the Colossians then and to us now is... No, you can't do that. Jesus doesn't work like that. He is all or nothing. Fill your plate with Him and Him alone. He is 
God revealed to us the very image of the invisible. All wisdom and knowledge are found in Him. And so for all these reasons, go to the buffet and choose Christ. Now, a little over a month ago, our church hosted something called Christmas Camp. And I hope, uh, I hope that doesn't bring any flashbacks to those who helped out with that event. But it was an all-day thing where, where kids came to play games and make crafts and learn uh, not only about the Christmas story, but about why Jesus came to this earth at all. The idea that He came to die on our behalf, to save us from our sin, to rise again and ensure eternal life for all those who believe. It was a busy week, and we were able to share the gospel with a number of kids who were clueless about it, who had no familiarity. And so we praise God for that opportunity. And during our Christmas camp event, we served the kids lunch. And I wonder if you could guess what was on the menu. If you had to guess, you would probably say things like mac and cheese and corn dogs and chicken nuggets, right? All kid favorites. We can predict what a kid will like to eat because kids like to eat junk food, right? I mean, we all like to eat junk food. I know I'm not above it. But when I do have a proper dinner, I do not have to be convinced and coaxed into eating my vegetables. I know they're good for me. And so I, of my own free will, I will place them on my plate and eat them. I have matured over the years. Right? I no longer eat like a child or make culinary decisions like a child. My palate has matured. And maturity is the main thrust of Colossians chapter 3. And we've talked a lot about it already to this point. But Paul continues, and he's calling us out of a childlike understanding and into the fullness of Christ. He wants his fellow Christians to taste and see that the Lord is good, as Psalm 34 puts it. So he's encouraging us to put down the junk food and step into maturity as we partake of Christ and His glory. And that's exactly where we left off last week. And so we start with last week's memory verse, which comes to us from uh, the first verse of Colossians 3. It says, Therefore, if you were raised with Christ, look for the things that are above where Christ is sitting at God's right side. Now, you cannot get any more supreme than that, sitting at God's right side. Now, verse 2, think about... Verse 2 of chapter 3. Think about the things above and not things on earth. Very simple. Think about the things above and not things on earth. But let me just stop for a second because there are a few things to glean from just this one sentence. Paul is going to go on to explain the, the what here in a moment. You know, what are the things above that we should think about? He kind of lists that out. But I want to stop and notice that our actions and our words, the words we say, the beliefs we hold, the decisions we make, all of these things begin somewhere. We do not just jump into sin. There's a prelude to any sin, and that is a thought. Everything we do or say begins as a thought. And yes, that includes our beliefs, it includes uh, what we hold to be true of God. I have to decide in my own mind to trust this book, to believe in the words that it says. Uh, it's a decision that I come to. And I sometimes have to tell my heart not to fear. I sometimes have to tell my soul to sing praise to the Lord. Often I have to tell my tongue to stay, stay. Don't say what you want to say. Stay. Now these functions of belief and behavior are dictated by our thought life. And so Paul cuts through all the noise and all the excuses we could make and all the people that we could blame and he bluntly says, think about the things that are above. That is a good starting place. And that's going to solve a lot of our human problems, I believe. And so it sounds dumb to say it out loud, but we need to think about our thoughts. We need to think about our thoughts. It's something that we have to learn to do. Kids do not do this naturally. 
right? Just like we know what they want for lunch, we also know what they're going to say when we ask them, now, why did you do that, right? Why did you do that? Who do you think you are? What are you going to do now? Now that you've made this mess, now that you've done this thing, why did you do that? And the answer is just too classic. I don't know, right? A kid will say, I I don't know. Now I, as a parent, have banned my kids from giving me that answer. When they say it, I remind them that uh, they are not allowed to say that. They need to put some thought into what they have said and what they have done or what and why they did or said that thing. Now, to be honest, I don't know how well this strategy works, but Paul is essentially saying the same thing. Think about what you think about. Is my mind on things above? Critique yourself. And when you do that, you will grow into maturity. Verses 3 and 4. You died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with Him in glory. All right, so Paul references the hiddenness of our lives in Christ. Remember, he's talking to people who uh, are being bombarded with this Gnostic idea of hidden information, this secret knowledge. We really, we see the same thing today. Any uh, infomercial or new product pitch claims to have a better solution for some problem, right? It's a solution you don't have access to, so you have to buy the thing, and then you too will be in the know. That's how it works. And Paul is saying, you don't need hidden knowledge. We know that we ourselves need to be hidden in Christ, who, by the way, is our life. Maybe you've said that about someone. Maybe you've said in passing, well, sports is his life. Or she just lives for her music. Something along those lines. And so the question is, can people look at our lives and say, they really love Jesus? Can they look at us and say, Jesus is their life? And if people were able to say that about someone, then they would also be able to note a certain maturity about that person. If Jesus is your life, it's going to come across. It's going to come across. This verse is a companion to other places in Paul's letters. We saw that in Philippians as well. Philippians 1.21, to live is Christ, to die is gain. Or Galatians 2, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In other words, Christ defines our life. Not our genetics, not our upbringing, not our background, Christ defines our life. Now, Paul gets into some specifics in verse 5. He says, So put to death the parts of your life that belong to the earth, such as sexual immorality, moral corruption, lust, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry. The wrath of God is coming upon disobedient people because of these things. You used to live this way when you were... Uh, alive to these things, but now set aside these things such as anger, rage, malice, slander, and obscene language. Don't lie to each other. Take off the old human nature with its practices and put on the new nature, which is renewed in knowledge by conforming to the image of the one who created it. In this image, there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, Barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all things and in all people. Now, this list that Paul gives um, is not all that surprising. Really, most of us would be able to duplicate such a list. We easily recognize these things as bad things, right? Sexual immorality and corruption and greed and rage and obscene language. Even the general unchristian public would agree that these things are generally to be avoided. But here is where we differ as Christians. The difference comes in our reasoning. See, we don't just think murder and envy and rage and and, and immorality are bad because they hurt other people. They are bad ultimately because 
They are an affront to the image of God in which we were created. That's why we avoid these things. And as such, these things are not just to be avoided, but what does Paul say in verse 5? He says, they are to be put to death. Not just avoided, put to death. Why? Because Jesus was put to death on account of these things. As Paul said earlier, he nailed all these sins to his cross. And when we fill up on Jesus, when he becomes our all in all, he empowers us to put to death our sins. He empowers us to enter more and more into maturity. And so now that he's addressed the things below, the things that we are to put to death, Paul now shares with us what he means by the things above. He says in verse 12, Therefore, as God's choice, holy and loved, put on compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Be tolerant with each other. And if someone has a complaint against anyone, Forgive each other. As the Lord forgave you, so also forgive each other. And over all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. The peace of Christ must control your hearts, a peace into which you were called in one body, and be thankful people. The word of Christ must live in you richly. Teach and warn each other with all wisdom by singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Sing to God with gratitude in your hearts. Whatever you do, whether in speech or action, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus and give thanks to God the Father through Him. So once again, not many of these items listed will come as a surprise, right? But also once again, it's the reasoning behind the mature behavior that sets us apart. For instance, why do we forgive others? I mean, there are many reasons, practical reasons, right? We, we want to have peaceable relations. We want to smooth things over. Uh, we want to move on uh, to set ourselves free from uh, any sort of grudge. Okay? But in Paul's thinking, the ultimate and primary reason we forgive is because God has forgiven us. We have been forgiven, and so we forgive. That's where it follows. That's where the reasoning is, originates. And it's not at all because of some sort of uprightness in us, right? It's an action we take solely based on the actions God has already taken on our behalf. It's that image of God in us. We forgive because He forgives. He forgave, right? And so we live into His image as we too forgive. We live peacefully, not because we are somehow peaceful people, but because Christ in us is peaceful. We live according to His Word, not because we are such great students of it, but because the Word of Christ dwells richly within us. Verse 17 ties up any loose ends that we might find when he simply says, whatever you do, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. And so can you even imagine Imagine what our lives would be like if we actually lived this way. Oh, the things that I would not say. (laughs) The hurt I would not inflict. The anger I would not allow to get the best of me. Yes, I need to learn to be self-controlled. But this maturity that Paul talks about is not just a matter of, of catching myself before I sin. It's more so a matter of allowing Jesus to become master over my thought life. And when that's the case, then there are comebacks and insults and comments that will not even occur to me to utter. Does that make sense? When Christ is my all in all, these smart remarks are never even conceived in my mind, and so they never give birth out of my mouth begins with our thought life. Paul closes out this chapter with a glimpse of what life would be like if we were to do everything in the name of Jesus. And he gets pretty specific here as he focuses on the home life of the average family. Okay, This is sort of a picture of what it would be like if we did everything in the name of Jesus. Verse 18. Uh, I'll read through the rest of the section here. He says, Wives, 
Submit to your husbands in a way that is appropriate to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and don't be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything because this pleases the Lord. Parents, don't provoke your children in a way that ends up discouraging them. Slaves, obey your masters on earth in everything. Don't obey like people pleasers when they're watching. Instead, obey with the single motivation of fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, do it from the heart, uh, from the heart for the Lord and not for people. You know that you will receive an inheritance as a reward. You serve the Lord Christ. That evildoers will receive their reward for their evil actions. There is no discrimination. Masters, be just and fair to your slaves, knowing that you yourselves have a master in heaven. Keep on praying and guard your prayers with thanksgiving. So Paul addresses everyone here as he begins. Wives, submit to your husbands. I mean, you can almost feel the Colossian men nodding along. (laughs) Yeah, you tell them, Paul, right? That's the way it should be. But then Paul sets his sights on the men. Husbands, love your wives. You're not off the hook here. In fact, for husbands, husbands, it's the harder calling. Any, Any submission your wife might give in marriage is contingent upon the amount of love they receive from their husband. In fact, I would say, in most cases, Wives do not at all mind submitting to a man when they trust him to always love them. Children are to obey. I mean, I I love this verse. I quote it faithfully to my kids. I love the implications of such a verse, and I'm glad that it's here for us in the Bible, in print for all to see. Why are kids to obey? Is it because parents are always right and wise and patient, and deserving? No. No. Kids obey, and adult children too, honor their parents because it pleases the Lord. That's why. So, we could end it there. We could all go home inspired. (laughs) But Paul insists on turning the tables on parents as well. Specifically fathers. So, He says, do not provoke your children in a way that discourages them. Okay, so we were doing so well. But Paul has to bring parents into the equation here. And I want to just note here, the the CEB, the Common English Bible, which is the translation that we use uh, in the church, you know, that's in the church pews. Um, And and it's readable, it's good, it's it's useful. Uh, There's no perfect translation. But I do think they kind of drop the ball here in this verse. Verse 21, they render as parents, don't provoke your children. Well, in the Greek, Paul unequivocally uses the word fathers. He is speaking about fathers. So the verse should read, fathers, do not provoke your children. And there's just a few things about this. You know, we would say, yes, the ancient world was much more uh, patriarchal. So the household was ruled by the father. So the verse uh, was, would have, when, when they say parents, it would have been understood that fathers were the one in charge. Okay? Um, the, uh, there, this verse does not, when it says fathers, don't provoke your children, it's not somehow saying that mothers then are allowed to somehow do that, right? Um, so in some sense, the term parents, it's fine. It works decently enough. But in another sense, the word is fathers. Paul says fathers. So I don't think we should change words just to kind of appease the the predilections of our finicky culture. We're trying to be more egalitarian and all that. But Paul says fathers. And so I just want us to understand that he says fathers because I believe fathers play a very crucial role in the leading of their family. Right? They love fathers. They are to love their family, and the children are to obey them, and the wives are to submit to them, not to lord it over them, right? It's not, fathers are not in control to have an iron fist, but rather to exemplify and model the love of Christ within their homes. And that love is self-giving, self-sacrificing. So just make no mistake that this role is the privilege of a father, but it's also the duty of a father to love his family. 
And saying that in no way diminishes the role of mothers, especially in a culture like ours that, that wants to denigrate the, the evils of patriarchy. Right? We, we think of that as a bad thing. But I just want to be clear about what the text actually says. The text does speak specifically to fathers, and I think it's a call that fathers need to uh, take on, especially onto their own shoulders as they love and, and raise up their families. So, um, if things were not controversial enough, Paul goes on to tell slaves to obey their masters. Okay, so we need to just take a big sigh. Um, in, 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 interestingly, the CEB does not shy away from that term. The term is slaves. And of course, we need to read the entire section, right? Paul has a word for those who own slaves as well. As we see, he talks to masters. Um, they are to be just and fair because they themselves have become slaves to Christ. So they have a master in heaven. And that will dictate how they function as masters on this earth. Now, we tend to frown on this whole section because we want Paul to tell these slave owners to set their slaves free, right? That seems to be the only Christian response here. That's what we want to see happen. How can someone be fair and just while still enslaving another person? Well, as it reads, just as the text reads, Paul seems to be okay with slavery. So, we need to deal with this section. And there is some historical background that we have to consider. Um, first of all, we have to separate slavery in ancient Rome from slavery as it was found in our own country. Okay? The term is the same. It's the same term, but the two are not equated. Um, in ancient thought, slaves were considered property, but they were also considered to be people. And that's a concept that Paul specifically endorses, that the slave is a brother. There is no slave and free. We are brothers in Christ. We're all one. Um, he wants to point out that even though a person is a slave, they too are created in the image of God. And as a master, you need to honor that. But slaves at that time actually had a better shot at social advancement uh, within service to their masters. So free peasants had very little prospect at a better life. Um, and so unlike slavery as we know it, most of those who were in slavery would have been able to eventually buy their freedom at some point and kind of make a better life for themselves within the context of slavery. So it's not to say that the life of a slave could not be harsh or dehumanizing. It's not to say that uh, it was a great <laughs> institution of the culture. Um, it wasn't. But it is to say that simply freeing all of one's household slaves would not necessarily improve their lot at that time. Okay, So Paul is not an activist speaking out against a man-made institution, but he is speaking life in Christ to those involved in it. Does that make sense? Slaves, obey. Masters, treat them well. And the title of each person, slave or master, that title pales under our primary identity in Christ. And so in either case, each person, slave or master, is to serve the Lord. Those who do evil, he says, whether slave or master, will reap the consequences without discrimination. And so the dynamic in this world that Paul describes is one in which a master would love uh, a love to have slaves who are Christians, right? A Christian master would love to have slaves who are Christians because they work harder. They're more respectful. And, um, these, uh, and, they, excuse me, and these Christian slaves would not mind working for their Christian master because with that master they are treated with all justice and all fairness. They're treated well. That's the dynamic, the picture that Paul is, is painting. And, and he sums it all up with one more admonition. Keep on praying and guard your prayers with thanksgiving. It takes us right back to where we started today. Back in verse 2, Paul says, think about the things above. And how can we do this? 
How do we keep our mind on the things above? We keep on praying. Well, in this way, we, we keep soldiering on into maturity. When our minds are on the things above, we don't need to worry about our status in this life. We keep our minds on heaven when we're laid up in the hospital, when we've just been shunned or insulted by an enemy, when we have an argument with our spouse, or even when we find ourselves under the ownership of another person. These circumstances are seen for what they are. Temporary. Christ is our all in all. We keep our minds set on Him. As we enter more fully into maturity in our relationship with Jesus, we will see our palates mature as well. We will not crave the same things. We will not reach for the same old dish that used to be our favorite. We will put to death the old. We will not think the same thoughts. We will experience transformation. In the book, The Good and Beautiful God, James Bryan Smith shares the story of a man named Carey. Carey was a good father. He was successful in his career. He even taught Sunday school at his church. But because he traveled a lot for work and he had ample opportunity, Carey struggled with pornography and the things that were available to him on this buffet, right? He found his plate being filled with things he should not have been partaking in. Carey was running into a roadblock in his maturity. He still craved the junk. But with the help of a good pastor, with some patience, some purposeful prayer, Carey found that his tastes began to change. And ironically, the things that this world considers to be only for the mature were in fact the very things keeping him from spiritual maturity. And so he was able to conclude that, yes, he was a sinner, but more importantly, he was a child of God. And as he took on that new identity, as he soldiered on, fought this fight, and strived to make Christ the foundation of who he was, he discovered freedom. He discovered freedom once he was able to anchor his identity in Christ. He had the buffet of all that the world offers there at his fingertips, right, with a single push of the, the TV remote. And yet he chose not to partake in it, but rather to find his fill in Christ. His palate had matured. And he found he no longer had to eat the junk food. May the same be true of us. May we step into maturity and allow Christ to be our all in all. May that be our prayer. Amen. Well, as we come to this communion table, a place where Jesus invites us to come and partake to come and choose Him, to fill up on Him and the things that He offers us. There's so many options. We have the whole buffet to choose from. So many things in this world that can take our time and our energy, that can take, our, take up space in our minds and in our hearts. Jesus says, come. Come to me. Fill up on me. Try me for a change. And so as we think about finding our identity in Christ and being rooted in, in who He is, this communion table is a perfect place to start. That idea of union, where we can be unified with God. We are reinstated in our relationship with God here at this table. Jesus brings to us His body. He brings to us His blood. And by these things, we are made whole. We are made able to overcome the things of this world, to put to death the old self, and to become, uh, truly, to truly let Christ live fully within us. And so I want to ask you to join me in prayer as we approach the table.
Father God, thank You so much for the gift of Jesus. Thank You that we don't have to wallow in sin, that we don't have to continually stuff ourselves with the extra um, ideas and, and bad thoughts of this world. Thank You that we can subsist on Christ. In Him, we can find our lives. So Lord, we're sorry. We come to You confessing our sins. Knowing that these sins start with our thoughts. Knowing that these sins are are pursued by us. We enjoy them. God, give us a distaste. Mature our palate. Give us a new menu that we could want to fill up on Christ and on Christ alone. We're sorry for the things that we have said and the things that we have done. We're sorry for the hurt that we have caused. We're sorry because not only because we've hurt other people, but we, because we've tarnished the image that You have created within us. We've not fully lived into the image of God. Lord, help us. Heal us. Make us whole and wash us clean. We thank You for the gift of the bread and the wine. We thank You for the gift of Your Son to come and do that very work, the thing that we are not capable of doing, bringing us back into relationship with You. What a glory. What a grace. Help us to live into transformation that we truly would become more and more Christ-like as we pass our days on this earth. Strengthen us in our weakness, Lord. We pray that Your Holy Spirit would come. That Your Holy Spirit would make for us this bread and this juice be the body and blood of Christ. That when we partake it, we in turn will become the body of Christ to this world that is crying out for truth. This world that is crying out for wholeness. This world that needs to be reunited with the God that they are missing. Empower us, Lord, and strengthen us by Your Spirit through this meal. Thank You for Your forgiveness. Thank You for new life. In Jesus' name we pray. It was at supper with his disciples that Jesus took the bread. He raised it, gave thanks for it, and broke it. He said, take and eat. This is my body, broken for you. Do this in memory of me. After supper, Jesus took the cup. He raised it. Gave thanks for it. He poured it out and said, This is my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink in remembrance of me. As often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the coming of our Lord. We live into the mystery of our faith. When we say, Christ has died, Christ has risen. And Christ will come again. This is the grounding of our hope. This is the the beginning of our new lives. And so I am privileged and honored to be able to declare to you, your sins are forgiven. You have been made whole. So go and sin no more. And live into the life that Christ has promised for us. Would you pray with me? Father God, thank You for Your Word. Thank You for this table. Thank You for sustaining us. Thank You that You never send us out alone, but Your Spirit goes with us. And so God, we ask for victory over our sins. We ask for victory in our thought life that we would be able to keep our minds focused on on the things above and that we'd be able to do so through the, the power of your Holy Spirit, thanks to the gift of your Son. 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, as we dismiss here today, I want to remind you and encourage you to continue giving faithfully to the work of this church. As I mentioned before, we have met our first goal for our new pavilion that we're hoping to uh, have going up this spring. So thank you for that. Um, we are blessed to be able to have the, the funds to do such things in this church. So we want to encourage you to continue to give faithfully and with a joyful heart. Next week, we'll wrap up Colossians. It'll be our last uh, sermon on, the, on Colossians, and we will be moving into... Um, we'll actually be having... We'll be inviting a couple missionaries, Kelly and Steve Solheim, to come and share with us about the work that they're doing in Honduras. So we are excited to welcome them uh, welcome them in a couple weeks. As we go, I want to read to you our memory verse from Colossians 4, chapter 2. Keep on praying and guard your prayers with thanksgiving. Don't give up praying. I'm going to leave you with this dismissal. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May He sustain you. May He be in you fully. May you cling to Him all your days. Go in peace. Amen.